Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for Improving Outcomes for Neurological Patients, Integration of Rehabilitation Techniques. Our presenter is Dr. Janice Huntingford, who is a 1984 graduate of the Ontario Veterinary College, University of Guelph in Guelph, Ontario. She is certified in chiropractic, acupuncture, rehabilitation, and pain management. She is the owner and medical director of the Essex Animal Hospital Canine Rehab and Fitness in Essex, Ontario, Canada. In 2015, she became a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Sports Medicine and Rehab. And in 2018, she received her master's in traditional Chinese veterinary medicine. Dr. Huntingford is a consultant for the VIN Rehab Sports Medicine Chronic Pain Board and lectures nationally and internationally on a variety of holistic topics, including rehab and geriatric medicine. She has co-authored several textbook chapters and published a number of peer-reviewed manuscripts. In her spare time, she enjoys spending time at the farm winery with her chef husband, Harold, and her pugs, cats, horses, and by the way, a few adult children. We welcome Dr. Huntingford. Well, uh, thank you, Carolyn. You know, now I have only time to spend uh, with my oh. children and my pugs because with COVID I can't go anywhere. So a lot, lots of time to, uh, lots of time to do that. But thank you so much to CC Animal Health for uh, sponsoring this talk. Oops, and I better figure out how to advance my slides. There we go. Um, so I like to start these things with a with a case because I'm very pumped about doing neurological rehabilitation and I know that neurology is not everybody's favorite thing. I have to say that when I graduated from vet school all those years ago, there were two things I never wanted to do. One was neurology and, and the other was anything to do with orthopedics or cruciates. And I mean, I'm now boarded in sports medicine and rehab, so that's all I kind of do. And so really, I guess you should always make your words sweet because you might eat them. But this case is great and it really demonstrates why I get up every morning and put on my pants and come to work. And this is Atari. Atari is an 11 year old unspayed female American Eskimo who was presented to me actually on the 21st of February of 2018. And uh, that this dog at that time was a total quadriplegic unable to even sit up on her chest. She had come from a rescue uh, down south that deals with a uh, group that I also deal with in Canada. and. Um, so this dog came up and they were hoping to rehome it. Uh, it had a few issues, it was geriatric, it would bite everybody in sight and um, you know it wasn't spayed. So when it was injured I actually talked to the rescue and said are you sure you really want to put all of your resources into this dog because it's going to be an extensive rehabilitation to get it better and it turned out that this dog uh, they had me do the one treatment on the 21st of February and the dog ended up with a guardian angel who said I will pay for all the rehab for this dog. So we I said great so this is actually the second time I saw this dog and now she's up on her chest so that's really good. So we're I have a series of videos of her recovery but I'll tell you a little bit about what we did. We did acupuncture with her uh, twice a week for about the first month. We sent them home with an Assisi loop and they were using that. They were supposed to use it four times a day initially. They probably really only used it about uh, about twice a day for a while and then gradually decreased the amount of time that they used it. Uh, we did have her on some uh, gabapentin, we did therapeutic exercises with her, we did underwater treadmill, some neurological patterning that you'll see uh, that we'll look at uh, in a little bit. So here she is on March the 12th and she is in my underwater treadmill with Melanie, one of my technicians. And usually if you see underwater treadmill videos, you know that generally the dogs are walking away from the person who's in there, but uh, Atari walked better towards Mel and these two really bonded. But here we had, remember the 21st of February, this dog was a quadriplegic and uh, now, you know, she's walking in the water. So March 18th, 
I have another little video here. And so th this is her kind of relearning to walk on land. So when we teach them to walk again, we put them in positions that are going to be normal for them. So a dog should normally stand. So we try to stand them square. And that's the first thing that we do is we get them to learn how to balance. And then after they learn how to, uh, how to balance, we then get them walking. So here, March 21st, she's walking like a drunken sailor. Hey, but uh, she's walking. And then oh, April 11th, we have her as well here. This is a much better walk. She's still not 100% normal, but she's moving around quite a bit. And then this is April 18th. This was the last video that we had of her because she's walking pretty well. So of course, what ended up happening was um, Melanie adopted her and you know we spayed her and that sort of stuff, but she was the only one that the dog did not wish to bite. So, <laughs> so Melanie adopted her. So how about an overview of these neurological cases? Well, I think most of us will find that neurological cases can be very difficult to manage uh, because you need to, you might need to normalize the tone, look at proprioception, optimize function. Some of these things have more tone, some have less tone, um, and they're not always the same. You have, there are some tricks that you can, uh, can use that will really help you with any of your neurological patients. And what we need to remember is that the main aim of our neurological rehabil rehabilitation is to restore function. So we're going to use specific exercises, we use lots of different modalities, and sometimes things work and sometimes they don't, but um, there are usually very specific things that we do that help with recovery. One thing that's very important is uh, diagnosis because the diagnosis is going to help set our goals and give our prognosis. So I'm gonna show you how to do some neurological diagnoses without having to have an MRI. And an MRI is great, but I don't know about you, but not all of my clients can afford to have an MRI or a CT done. And client education, really important so that the clients know what they're getting into. So here's a lovely little picture to remind us of the difference between upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron when we're talking about spinal cord disease. So our upper motor neuron system is in green and our lower motor neuron is the one that's in red. So when we're talking about dogs who have upper motor neuron disease in the spine, then the upper motor neuron a system exists between C1 and C5 and between T3 and L3, right? So that, that's exactly what it says on this slide. And our lower motor neuron is going to be C6 to T2 or L4 to S1. So it, it's really um, an interesting thing when you think about the upper motor neuron. Upper motor neuron tells the lower motor neuron what to do, right? Generally, if we have lower motor neuron um, issues, it tends to be more peripheral neuropathies. Uh, not, not in all cases, things like Coonhound paralysis is a little bit different, but uh, that, that's where we can think about it generally. And I just want you to remember the C1 to C5 and T3 to L3 for the upper motor neuron and the other ones really being lower motor neuron. Why is that important? Well, we'll talk a little bit about it later, but um, it has to do a lot of times with, with tone and what do we do. So as I said, the upper motor neuron system tells the lower motor neuron what to do and it's going to stimulate or inhibit the lower motor neuron. So if upper motor neuron is not working properly, you may end up with a lower motor neuron system that's really stimulated. So that's why you end up with uh, some of these dogs with very, very stiff legs. It's because the upper motor neuron isn't doing its job. Remember, it's the upper motor neuron system that initiates voluntary movement and maintains muscle support against gravity, which is why the default system, if your upper motor neuron is not working, is 
is spastic paralysis, like it's stiff. Why? Because maybe if your legs are stiff, you can still move. If they're all crumpled up, you really can't. So the lower motor neuron is really the one that connects the CNS to the muscles and is responsible for spinal reflexes. So that, that's all we're really going to talk about neurology as far as, uh, you know, things that we have to think about with diagrams and that sort of stuff. But I do a neuro exam on all of my on all of my patients uh, that come in for rehabilitation, even if I think that they have orthopedic disease. And there is a reason for that. And the reason is that sometimes you can be fooled. I want you to have a look at this video of this dog walking and see what you think. So is this a neurological case? Or is this an orthopedic case? So this is interesting. It's an 11 year old, uh, it's an 11 year old St. Bernard. It was sent to me by a boarded surgeon because this dog was supposed to have um, a bilateral total hip done and he was too young. So the surgeon wanted him to gain some muscle and um, he wanted him to have some prehab before he did the total hip on the dog. I did a complete exam on this dog, including a neuro exam and darn it, this dog had wobbler's disease. So I had to tell this to the client and uh, we, we ended up uh, eventually treating him for the, for the wobbler's disease. So that was, uh, that was an interesting thing. And the dog never did get his total hip done. He did get surgery for wobblers. But it, it, you know, it, it makes you look bad if you don't actually do a complete exam on all of these patients. So if I'm doing a physical exam, really, what am I looking for? If, if a dog comes in that's a neurological case, is it a seizure case? Is it vestibular? Is it coonhound paralysis? Uh, you know, is, is it a dog that has IVDD? So I want to actually watch the dog walk around because most of the time, um, this dog may have had a referring veterinarian and perhaps they haven't even seen the dog walk. So you need to wa watch them walk around, um, see what their behavior is, their their mentation, their posture, all of these kinds of things. And here's a great picture of a dog with a roached back. And you know, the this posture with the head low, um, th this is definitely, you know, this dog has some pain going on there. We also look at how easily is the dog pushed off balance? Does it stand with one leg extended or dragging? So I, I really like to have my phone and I will take videos and I will take lots of pictures because then I can look at them later and go, did that dog really, was he dragging that leg? Was he, what was he doing? How does he look when he goes over the Cavalettis? And so I really, uh, I find that when I'm doing gait evaluation um, like this, uh, if I video them, I can always slow them down and have a look. Now, this dog is actually standing on a yoga mat that's over top of my tech scan, but and the tech scan is a very complicated uh, piece of equipment for gait analysis. And I do some research, so that's why I have one. But you don't need one; you just need uh, a video camera. You just need your iPhone, really, and need to think about lameness and what's going on. But this is a very interesting dog that did have a T3 L3 myelopathy. So. When we are looking at many neurological cases, they have ataxia and ataxia can be quite challenging as to how to figure out what to do uh, with, this, with this dog. What kind of ataxia does it have? So hopefully this particular little chart will let you know that if we have ataxia and we really don't have any paresis, that's just a cerebellar lesion. And ataxia can be so severe the patient's unable to walk, but it doesn't have paresis. So, but if we, if we have paresis and no ataxia, that tends to be a neuromuscular problem, right? Like a myopathy, a junctionopathy, uh, polyradicular neuropathy is what I usually see. And paresis in the pelvic limbs, so paraparesis without ataxia, can also be seen in lumbosacral disease. So we'll look a little bit at those things. So how about different tests? Well, what kind of things are we going to do if we're looking for ataxia and weakness? Well, I like to use this as these are weave cones that we're using. Um, this dog 
does not have ataxia, but this was just a pretty decent uh, thing about, this is another dog actually that has a bilateral hip issue. However, hopping, cavaletti, stairs, weaves, will do all of these sort of things looking for anything abnormal. Although this dog has very severe orthopedic disease, it's not crossing its back legs. It's not uh, having any issues like that. Now, this is a very interesting dog. So you remember that I said that um, paresis or <clears throat> ataxia without paresis is usually a cerebellar lesion. So this dog has ataxia, but he doesn't have any paresis at all. This is a Jack Russell with cerebellar abiotrophy. So interesting little case. How about this patient? So this, this patient has paresis, but he's really not not ataxic. He's more stiff than anything else. This was actually an early case of coonhound paralysis. And here's our paresis without ataxia that can be seen with lumbosacral disease. This is a video that was sent to me by Dr. Rick Wall. Uh, I just thought it was a really good uh, video showing this type of gait. So how about our sequence of neurological deficits? Wouldn't you like to know what's going to happen when? Uh, I would. So made, made up this chart. <laughs> we, we keep this. My residents look at this chart. We think about it. I show it to my clients. So the disease progresses from proprioception to some paresis and ataxia to plegia to bladder dysfunction to tail dysfunction to pain. Okay, so that's, and it, it comes back in the reverse order. So that's a very interesting thing to think about. So if you have a client who says to you, well, I don't understand my dog with neurological disease is getting better, but you know, his, he still has those, he's still knuckling. Well, of course, because that's the last thing to come back. And if they don't realize that, they're going to wonder. So when I'm doing a neuro exam and I'm doing a, uh, I'm looking at all of these patients, I'm not taking a super long time like they teach you in vet school to do stuff, although I'm doing an awful lot. So I look at proprioception and postural reactions. I do a very quick cranial nerve exam. Um, spinal reflex is very important. And the, the reflex that, that I really uh, like to test the most is called the crossed extensor reflex, which is an upper motor neuron reflex. And I've got some examples of it. You'll see with that, I'm going to check dermatomes. I'm going to check for paniculus. I'm palpating the spine. I'm looking for pain. And uh, I'm doing that with every single patient that I'm evaluating in my rehab center. So proprioception, uh, we can see this dog here is having some issues with proprioception. So obviously it's being tested by hopping or paw placement. In cats, you can test it by wheelbarrowing the cat, which is uh, an, an important thing to do. Uh, we have to remember it's testing forebrain, brain stem, and the spinal cord, right? And so any of these things, cerebellar, neuromuscular, so it, it can occur very early in disease and it's a good indicator of the presence of disease, but is not useful to differentiate spinal cord from, from brain disease in general. And um, it, it's also not necessarily a predictor of how bad your, uh, your spinal cord issues or your uh, neurological problems are going to be. So here's one, a little video just to show you that no susception and withdrawal are not the same. So we're <clears throat> gonna do a withdrawal reflex on this dog. I'm gonna turn him on his side. We're gonna do a withdrawal reflex on him. And he has, he does have neurological disease, but we pinch his toe and he's like, okay, okay. You know, you could probably stop doing that anytime. And now we have another dog with spinal cord disease and we're pinching his toe with a um, hemostat. Um, this dog does have withdrawal, but does he have no susception? Nope. He doesn't even know. So this is an important thing to remember that withdrawal and no susception are not the same. 
So our crossed extensor reflex, we talked about that, and this is very important reflex. What it is, it's an upper motor neuron reflex. When an animal quadruped is standing, it's a totally normal reflex. If you pick up one hind leg, you put all your weight on the other hind leg. However, this reflex is dampened when the animal is laying on its side. So if you pinch the, the toe to elicit withdrawal on the, on the top leg, the bottom leg shouldn't move at all. But uh, look at this. And pole four is not next. <laughs> Whoa, this is a great reflex though. This cat actually also had it in the, in the front legs. It was a cat that had uh, atlantial axial subluxation. But you pinch it, see the bottom leg pushes right out. So here is what we talk about pain sensation. And I think my, my major issue with people testing pain sensation is, is they'll take a dog that, um, that has some pain sensation or they think has pain sensation and they feel that they need to test it uh, with hemostats with a dog that is like walking but ataxic. That's, not, that's a no-no, that's painful. So you only test pain from plegia down in, in this, you don't need to stick your hemostats on something and, and test for pain in all cases. So why are we going to differentiate between our upper and lower motor neuron? Well, the reason that we're going to do that and the reason why I'm so interested in the crossed extensor reflex is because it tells me it's upper motor neuron. And why? Well, that's going to change my goals of treatment. Upper motor neuron problems, I want to decrease tone. I'm going to decrease spasticity. Um, you know, I may have a hypermetric gait, chronic atrophy, and I'm going to look at the root of the problem and I'm going to try to uh, address that. I'm going to work on strengthening. I'm going to decrease the tone. Whereas lower motor neuron, uh, we can't just work on strengthening. We have to retrain those motor control patterns and we need to increase tone. And in general, it's much more difficult to treat a patient who has a lower motor neuron problem than one who has an upper motor neuron problem. And I really like lists. So this is in my brain, how I break down uh, dogs with spinal cord disease. So, uh, you know, they either have pain or they have no pain or they're systemically ill. So if I break them down like this, I generally don't end up treating my discospondylitis dogs like an IVDD dog, right? Because those dogs are sick. And my IVD D dogs shouldn't really be systemically ill. They should still be eating and, and doing all these things. So I find that some of these little lists are very helpful. So what do we do about fixing the problems that we find? That's really what we are here to find out about, right? Uh, we want to do things that are going to be functionally uh, important. We want the dog to get back to activities of daily living, which for a dog is really to walk and scratch and, and be able to pee and poop and you know go outside and interact. But we have to think about while these animals with neurological disease are recovering, we have to address all of the secondary problems as well. So we need to address any compensation in muscles for pain. Bladder dysfunction is a huge, huge issue. And I still see patients referred to me that are down dogs that nobody's thought about taking care of the bladder. So if you, the first thing I want everybody to do the next time you see a down dog in your practice, take care of that bladder. Make sure we don't have skin lesions. You know, myofascial pain, those are things that, that you may need some help addressing, but everybody can figure out if the dog's peeing or not and not just overflow incontinence. They need to be actually peeing. So how about cage rest? Because if you talk to neurologists and they're talking about dogs, particularly with IVDD and conservative therapy, it's usually two weeks of cage rest. And what does that mean? That means the dog pretty much stays in a cage, goes out only to pee and poop, uh, may possibly come in a carrier to the, you know, to the rehab center, um, may not. It uh, depends on, on what exactly is going on. These dogs, I would love to have them in a cage in my hospital so I can do laser, I can do a CC loop lounge, I can, uh, I can do acupuncture. Uh, there's a lot of different things that I can do, a lot of non-drug therapies. I do drug therapies too. Sure, I use lots of gabapentin and I use meloxicam and I use amantadine and amitriptyline, but I use a ton of non-drugs too. 
So let's assume we have a patient that had pain and now the pain's under control. What are we going to do? Well, first of all, we need to talk to the client because we want to make sure that we set ourselves up for uh, recovery. How long is that going to be? And we can let the client know what the expectations are for this animal to recover 100%. Or, it, you know, is it post-surgery? How long is it going to be post-surgery? You know, what are we going to do with that? We need to focus on the recovery of function first and then recovery of strength and we're going to also address correction of the root problem and that's pretty much what we do and remembering that rehab's very holistic so we're treating the whole patient and the client and we have to think about nutrition these animals aren't moving very much easy for them to become obese we would really rather that they didn't become obese um, but certainly uh, it's certainly possible that they that they can so we have to remember nutrition for sure so what are the tools that we use in rehabilitation? Well, the ones that are in the dark print are really the ones I'm going to talk about today. I'm not really going to talk much about nutrition other than to say that dogs who are in recovery, unless they have kidney issues, really need a higher amount of protein. So putting them on a low protein diet at this point is not a good idea. You need protein to build muscle. Uh, and so you, you need to think about two things. One is obesity. And uh, if you want that patient to lose weight, please put them on one of the higher protein weight loss diets because there are some really good high protein weight loss diets. Rather than putting it on a high fiber uh, carbohydrate diet, much better to go more the Atkins type diet, the higher protein one, to maintain your muscle mass and the carnitine. Uh, acupuncture, electroacupuncture, I do tons of it, but we could talk an entire day about acupuncture, so we're, we'll just briefly mention it. Um, Proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation or patterning is something that I think everybody should learn how to do if you're going to treat any neurological dogs and they will help a lot of your dogs get better faster. Uh, massage is great. Again, you need a little bit of training with that. Everybody can do passive range of motion. If you have a laser, you can do laser. Uh, you can purchase the CC loops and use those. Exercise therapies, definitely possible for everyone to do. Underwater treadmill, well, you have to invest in a treadmill. And assistive devices, I'm going to talk about a few very cool assistive, de assistive devices that we use and that are um, very, very helpful for many of these patients. I know I'm going fairly quick. I have some great cases and I want you to really see them and I want to be able to focus on the things that I think you need to know to really help your patients. Now, here's one thing that you may or may not remember from veterinary neurology um, is that the generator for motion in the quadruped exists as special interneuron circuits throughout the spinal cord. So what does that mean? You know, why, why, am, I, why am I talking about this? What does this mean? So in the quadruped, the, the central pattern generators for motion do not rely on connection uh, with the spine. So, so that means that we can create dogs who are spinal walkers, where the interneuron circuits in the spinal cord have been wakened up by what we're doing. And these dogs, although they don't have uh, input from the brain, they can walk. So we're producing movement without supraspinal input. That's really what it means. So these things are generating and controlling limb coordination, rhythm, and speed through all gates. And normal movement patterns are really ingrained in our nervous system. And these are, disrupt these are disrupted when we have structural neurological disease, and it's going to affect the function. But we can regain a lot of it. Now, they may, may never be totally normal. They're going to be what we call spinal walkers. But you know what? My clients are really happy that they're walking. So the motor patterns that we have um, in the CNS, 
that's what modulates the movement. And we get sensory input from all of our, our nociceptors, our mechanoreceptors, Golgi tendon organs, and, and stimulating these things is very important to rebalance the nervous system. So part of what we do with neurological rehab is retrain motor patterns, and we do that using manual therapy. So things like chiropractic, massage, and stretching, um, those can be part of the manual therapy that's used. But you, even as an untrained person, can use PNF patterning. And there are certain therapeutic exercises that you can use that will really help your patients. In essence, we are doing what I call receptor-based therapy. So we are stimulating the neurological receptors and that is stimulating the spinal cord. It's giving feedback into the nervous system, feedback into the muscles, rebalancing everything. So what do I mean by that? So proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation is really re-educating unresponsive muscles. And what we are doing is we're stimulating movement patterns that are already functional and ingrained in the patient. So walking, running, scratching, sitting to stand, lateral to sternal, those are all normal movement patterns. And depending upon the patient's disability, you can do them in any position. Now, I'm going to give you a couple examples of these PNF patterns, but one is one that we call rhythmic stabilization. And so this is rhythmic stabilization, and it's really a fancy name for weight shifting, because what should happen is as you push this dog the one way, he should automatically put more weight on the other leg, right? So if we're doing the this sort of thing, we're actually helping out his muscles to remember that that's the way you wish to go. And here's another one. So this is obviously in our treadmill, but what we're what we're doing here is we're doing gait patterning or neuromuscular facilitation. She's pinching the end of this dog's tail because that actually stimulates him to walk. And you can do this on water and you can do it on land. But you know, then she'll see, okay, he's dragging a little bit. So then we'll go back to doing more patterning and then she'll go back to pinching the tail and having him do it. So it works out very well. So passive range of motion is something else that we can do. And it work, and it's very important in neurological patients because they're quite at risk of having contracture of tendons and ligaments, and passive range of motion mitigates this condition. Um, what you know so I've had many patients who come to me I, I had one little dog who had bilateral cruciate ruptures, and he um, he was a little Cairn Terrier and ended up, of course, being carried around by his owner quite a bit. But they did not, the, the veterinarian did not want to fix the, uh, the cruciates because the, the dog had some other medical condition and he wanted the medical condition to be stable first. So he, he got that dog stable medically, fixed both of the cruciates and then said, he couldn't figure out why the dog couldn't walk. Well, he spent six months not being able to walk. So the body says, if you don't move it, you lose it. And that's what happened. So that dog ended up with contractures. And that took, you know, a little bit of time for, for that to occur. We, we did get him back to normal and back to walking. But with neurological patients, the contractures happen much more quickly because um, that little dog who'd had the ruptured cruciate, I mean, he was still moving his legs around. He wasn't getting up and walking, but he was still moving his legs around, whereas these neurological patients are not. So if you're doing passive range of motion on these guys, you want to make sure that you're doing the, the joint of each limb in flexion and extension about 10 times before you flex the entire limb, because otherwise you can get a spasm and you and you can get pain. There's a few other things that can happen. Sometimes you're trying to flex and extend these these limbs and they're just stiff. They're stiff and straight. What are you going to do? Well, you tap over the muscle bellies till they uh, till they release. That's one thing you can do. And the other thing you can do is a sustained stretch. If you do a sustained stretch, it overcomes the spasm and then you can get on with your passive range of motion. So here's some neurological exercises that every practitioner should be able to recommend and do. 
this is a dog who's had a hemilaminectomy and he's going through an obstacle course. So he's having to step over things. This is pretty easy. The, these are cavalettis, but you can use broom handles. You could use hockey sticks. You could use anything. And this is just air mattresses and, and cushions. And that's kind of a cool thing from the fit bone people. But anything that's going to be a different surface is going to be helpful for this for dogs like this. So these are the other exercises. We're going to look at these assisted standing and assisted walking. The, these are the ones that you start with. You, you put the dog in a normal position like we did with the Tari and you try, you try to sit him up and down. And I have a video of that too. Our Cavalettis, which I, I think are really good to increase flexion and extension. They're great for proprioception. We use weave cones as well to help with balance and proprioception. High fives for dogs who have front leg injuries well, we may use that and then uneven surfaces like we see here with an air mattress and you know we can do an obstacle course like we did with this dog and that's kind of fun things that you can do in your clinic and things that clients can do as well at home and and these are important too because you want to make sure that you uh, are able to have things that the clients can do at home so cavalettis I probably should have a better example. I take so many pictures of dogs with Cavalettis, I could have a different one than this. <laughs> this dog wasn't super cooperative. But we 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 pretty much, uh, we've made these out of safety cones, PVC pipe, and red hockey tape. Um, you can buy them from different rehab places, but you can make them for fairly cheaply. But we're doing this, I love this exercise, is for geriatrics, neuro dogs, to help them work on their proprioception. And the height is going to depend on the height of the dog and the physical ability. And then we were talking about doing assisted standing. So here's a dog um, that has a T3 L3 myelopathy and Marty is having him, she's putting his legs square and she's kind of pushing him up and down. That, that's part of it as well. So right now she keeps recorrecting him. Out. Okay, so oh, now he pushed up himself. You see, so when we, we help them do this, it's easier if you do this on a... Um, you know, outside on a surface. And you see what she was doing afterwards, giving him positive reinforcement. We do a lot of that in rehab. This is another dog that we were doing some gait patterning with. And this is on our fancy treadmill. Um, <laughs> this was a treadmill I got at a garage sale. So this takes a little bit of manpower because you need two people here. Uh, but the client, if they had a treadmill, could do this at home. So you're just really gait patterning and you're doing, a, so that would be assisted walking. So how about some other things. Well, another thing that we do like to use quite a bit is pulsed electromagnetic field therapy. And if you're not really familiar with that, I mean, I'm doing uh, targeted pulsed electromagnetic field therapy because we use the CC loop for this and, and that's what that is, targeted pulsed electromagnetic field therapy. So it, it's really a pulsed or resonating magnetic field that's going to create some currents without healing and alter cell signaling. And what tissues does it affect? Well, it's going to affect blood and muscle and ligaments, bone and cartilage, all of these things that are going to respond to um, a biophysical input and uh, including electrical and electromagnetic fields. So what we really need, and the reason that um, I'm so interested in targeted PEMF is that we need proper field intensity and frequency if we're going to modify disease. The cartilage homeostasis is very much affected by stimulation of transforming growth factor beta and our targeted PEMF does do that and through the calcium calmodulin dependent pathways also our targeted PEMF is increasing nitric oxide activity so it's affecting our mitochondria. So the CC people, uh, 
you know, they, they don't just sell these loops, they're also very involved in doing clinical research. And I've got a couple of uh, clinical trials to, to tell you about. This was one that was out of NC State that was done by Dr. Natasha Olby. And she was studying post-operative grade five IVDD. And um, <clears throat> what she was looking for was to see if there was a difference uh, between the two groups, the, the sham group and the actual CC loop group, uh, if there was a difference in incisional pain level. And what they found was that in the loop treated group, there was definitely statistical significance. Uh, the pain was, uh, was much better managed with the dogs that were in the loop. They also looked at uh, a biomarker called GFAP, which is an indicator of neurological injury. And they found that there were lower levels of that in the loop treated group. And they also had a greater degree of recovery of proprioception in the, the dogs that were treated with the loop. So what are we using this for? Well, targeted pulsed electromagnetic field therapy is really being used for pain reduction, improving circulation, reducing edema, and for faster healing. And here's another uh, study. This is probably the most recent one. And this came out of the Animal Medical Center. Uh, Lalani Alvarez and um, a few other people there worked on this. And this was on um, the effect of targeted pulse electromagnetic field therapy on dogs post-op hemilaminectomy. So here's what they had. They had a double-blind placebo-controlled study. They had dogs that went on uh, underwent hemilaminectomy for naturally occurring disc, ex disc extrusion. They randomized it and either these dogs either received the targeted PEMF or they received a sham treatment. So what they really got was a loop that didn't do anything. Um, and then wound healing was evaluated and um, was significantly significantly improved at six week post-op in the treatment group compared to the sham group. And also we found that uh, pain medications were administered a lot less frequently in these dogs who received uh, the targeted PEMF during the seven day post-operative period as opposed to the sham group. And there were no untoward effects that were recorded in these dogs. So the Assisi loop, um, obviously, you probably know the uh, you probably know the website for Assisi Animal Health. But these are just you know some of their products. They have a couple of different sizes of loops. Obviously, the Loop Lounge, which is, which is what the cat is in this little sleepy pod thing, uh, is great. Actually, the Loop Lounge I think is truly the pad that's uh, down on the right there. But I really like this little thing that the cats are in because you can have hands-off treatment of these cats and small dogs and these little sleepy pods. Um, we have one that's in my clinic right now that we're using. Uh, it's, it's been absolutely great. But these are, so these when we talk about this, these are the products that we're using. And so what, what's happening? Well, the PEMP signal uh, has to pass deep enough through the tissue to produce some healing results. And so the, uh, it, it's really dependent upon the, the, free, the uh, frequency that you're using it and, and what exactly we're doing with it. So we tend to use it, um, you're going to, for two to three days, uh, you'll do it two to three times twice, like two to three times a day, blah, can't even speak two to three treatments per day for one to two weeks. I should just read what's on the slide. And then um, you might do one to three treatments weekly. So if you have a dog who has a hot disc and you're putting the ACC loop on it, you can do it up to four times a day. And then the time of the exposure, well, they say is 12 to 20 minutes, up to 90 minutes. Um, the beneficial effects can last up to three months. And how soon do you see results? Well, usually with acute inflammation, one to two treatments, you're going to see something. Um, if it's a chronic problem, it's going to take longer. And this is the sleepy pod thing with the kitty cat in it. Talk about a great hands off way to treat a cat who's painful or has any kind of uh, issue that you would like to use your CC loop on. And this is the loop lounge. So this is the pad. And you can get these for your clinic. Um, the only thing is if you're going to put them in your clinic and you're going to put them in your cage, don't put them in a metal cage. That would not be a very good thing to do. You'd want to do it in um, 
it, it, something that was in plastic or something that was pretty much non-metal. So how about other things that we use? Well, we do a lot of laser therapy in my practice. And this is Coco, who's a geriatric cat who has shoulder pain and she also has uh, hyperesthesia. And Coco just turned uh, 19. So we, we don't do a lot of drugs with Coco. We do a CC loop, we do laser, um, we do some massage and some chiropractic with her. And, uh, but she, she loves to come and, and we, we treat her quite well for an older girl. So what are the physiological effects of laser? Now laser and a CC loops have very, very similar uh, modes of action. But what we're going to see with photobiomodulation therapy, which is laser therapy, is we're going to get a reduction in pain and inflammation, and we're going to have an increase in microcirculation. So there's going to be an acceleration in tissue repair and also in wound healing. And that's another thing that we will see. We didn't talk about that much with the targeted PEMP, but you will see that with your CC loop as well. So degenerative myelopathy, interesting neurological condition. Uh, obviously, you know that it is a um, something that we can now detect with a, a, a genetic um, test and we're looking for mutations in the SOD1 uh, gene and if you have an animal who has both of the SOD1 genes affected then they're likely to get degenerative myelopathy if they only have one then obviously they're going to be a carrier uh, we see it in German Shepherds of course and we see it in corgis but there's been some new um, interest in treating this and I'll tell you how we treat it with rehabilitation because look at this and there's a there's a paper on this and I'm happy to provide you with that paper if you want to read it but the paper basically says that animals who receive physiotherapy had a longer survival time with a mean of 255 days compared to animals that did not receive any physical therapy who had a mean of only 55 days so I think that means that we should really be doing therapy on all of these degenerative myelopathy dogs and there's been a new paper that was published uh, by Dr. Lisa Miller and uh, Debbie gross Taraka, and it was published in Photobiomodulation Photomedicine and Laser Surgery Journal, and that is the, um, the DOI for it, so you can find it. It is an open access journal, so you should be able to read it. But what they were doing was they were using laser and uh, they had used a class 3B laser, so it was a lower powered laser, and then they used a class 4 laser, and it was a retrospective study that was done. Now, the amount of rehabilitation that was done was the same, so the only difference was the laser. And what they, what they found and they published in this paper was uh, at this dose here, 15 to 20 joules per centimeter squared, which is a big dose uh, for your laser. And they did it to the thoracic, thoracic and lumbar areas, uh, all the muscles and joints, and if the dog had any additional orthopedic problem. But this was what they got. And they found that the dogs lived longer. Uh, they went far out over and above um, what they had the length of life with the 3B laser. And you know, what, what were they really doing? Were they affecting the, the degeneration, the actual demyelination? Probably not, but they were probably affecting the fact that the, the compensatory muscles uh, were feeling better. So the dogs lived longer because remember, the clients are keeping these dogs around as long as they feel that they're comfortable. And this was just some digital thermal imaging that they did, the one on the left before photobiomodulation therapy and the one on the right after their treatment. So if you look at these digital thermal images, um, red is bad, <laughs> green is good. So, so that's what you're looking at there. So other therapies, there are a few other therapies you can use for um, degenerative myelopathy. Obviously intensive physiotherapy in the clinic, there are some herbals that you can use and I've listed them there. At home exercises, active and passive, very, very important to get your clients involved in this sort of thing. And then assistive devices. So help them up harnesses, which we'll talk about a little bit. This is a walking assist harness right here. Um, you can order these online, but what they really are is a harness 
with some kind of therabands attached to the dog's feet. And this one's kind of expensive. It's cheaper to have a harness and buy therabands, but you can use this for wobblers disease. You can use it for DM dogs. Um, they're very, very good. And there is some thought that maybe a grain-free diet, a homemade grain-free diet that is balanced with taurine and all the sort of stuff that you're supposed to use, that that may also be helpful for degenerative myelopathy and other assisted devices. So these are ones that I have found have been very helpful. This is a pug wearing toe grips. Now, toe grips seem to work quite well for early neurological disease, for dogs who are geriatric and they're, they're just getting weak, uh, dogs who are slipping on these hardwood floors and that kind of stuff. If you have truly a dog who has decreased conscious proprioception and is dragging his toes, he'll just drag those toe grips off. But this, these are really better for, uh, for dogs who... Um, you know, slipping on, on hardwood floors, but they are something that we do use. The help them up harness, um, I will show you another dog with a harness on it, but it's a back end, front end harness. We use them a lot in rehabilitation. It allows my smaller, uh, older patient, older clients to uh, take care of their dogs longer because they can get them in and they can get them out of, you know, the house up and down the stairs, that kind of stuff. Other things you can use, obviously diapers, wheelchairs, some bands, um, home modification, important, raise the dishes, yoga mats, though, those are important. So here's a help them up harness. And this is a dog we're doing some assisted walking with a help them up harness. This, this dog had a, a T3L3 myelopathy and had a hemilaminectomy. So, but this is, uh, these harnesses are great. So here's a couple other tips for your neuro patients. You can get a small vibrator like you would use for your back or an electric toothbrush uh, that you can use on the muscles to stimulate weak muscles. Obviously, if you're using the toothbrush, don't use the brushing side or you'll get caught in the hair. Uh, Tapping over the muscle bellies is going to stimulate those muscles to contract. And when you have to use postural reflexes like wheelbarrowing or hopping to really stimulate those dogs, take, take advantage of what, um, what nature is giving you with, with those reflexes because those reflexes are going to be very helpful for you. And here's another really cool thing. Wrap a tensor around the patient from the front to the back to create some awareness and to connect the front to the back. Alternatively, you can use a thunder shirt or a snuggly, and I have a video I'll show you on this. Remember, any sensory stimulation you provide is going to stimulate your superficial receptors. That's going to make things better. I have a client who does music therapy with people, and she had a dog with a spinal cord injury, and she played music to it and she swore the dog could walk better after a music therapy session, and that could be. But don't forget about counseling your clients about lifestyle changes, right? We talked about this already. So I wanted to show you this Sergi, well, this uh, Sergi Snuggly type uh, thing with this dog, the, the tensor wrap from the front to the back. This dog has a T3L3 myelopathy and is obviously quite ataxic. Now I didn't have at the time, I use something called medical pet shirts usually because those are the ones that I have and I put on the dogs. They are really designed for dogs post-surgery after like a spay so they don't lick at it but they don't have to wear the huge cones. So I didn't have one at this point that would, um, would work for this dog. So what I did was I took some uh, mesh gauze and that's in the next video. I took some mesh gauze and you'll see it as the dog walks by. I took and put it on the dog and you will see this is the same day. This video was taken like <laughs> within a few minutes. Now of course we have to follow mom right but look how much better this dog is walking. This dog is walking a lot better and that's just mesh gauze. Look, it's doing its own little uh, weave poles and everything. It's obviously not a hundred percent but it really helps the front to communicate with the back. So that's a good thing. So in the last nine or 10 minutes, um, I'm going to talk about some uh, geriatric neurological cases mostly. Um, other, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about um, IVDD and, and that kind of thing, but we're going to talk about uh, vestibular disease and a few other of these cases. So vestibular 
disease, as you know, can be either central or peripheral. Uh, and, and these are different ways that we treat them because from a conventional therapy standpoint, there's not a lot that you're going to do for vestibular disease, right? You're going to say, well, give it some time, see if it gets better. Um, but it would be nice to know if it's central or peripheral. So here's one hint. It's not always correct, but um, I think it's something that we can, we can think about. Uh, so central versus peripheral. Yes, I do know that if it's peripheral, we should have have horizontal nystagmus and if it's central typically we should have vertical nystagmus that that could be true but I look at conscious proprioception so if the dog has peripheral vestibular disease it will not have proprioceptive deficits it just doesn't now if you have a dog that already has proprioceptive deficits and then gets vestibular disease then it's difficult but if you had a dog who did not have conscious proprioceptive deficits and then suddenly is presented to you with vestibular disease and has proprioceptive deficits, the likelihood is that that dog has central vestibular disease. So that, that can help you because your peripheral vestibular disease should not. Um, herbal therapies, you may want to use them though those are what they are. I can always talk to you about them later. Uh, chiropractic can be helpful, but here's some rehabilitation things that you can do. Have the client stand the dog up every hour. Place the feet. Do assisted standing. Make sure the dog's not falling over. Place the feet. Make sure it's square. You can do the PNF patterns that a dog normally would. You can do some assisted sitting, sit to stand assistedly. You can do some match strike where you're, you can do assisted where you make the feet scratch the dog's ears. So you want as much of the time as putting the feet on the ground as possible to orientate the nervous system as to what is up and what is down. And any input into the nervous system can be valuable. Now there are some very specific rehabilitation maneuvers that you can use for dogs and we're not going to go into those because those are that, that would take you a few hours to learn how to do those. But um, if you do refer to someone who has done a lot of vestibular rehabilitation, they probably will do that. And that is to help uh, replace displaced otoliths. It's a, a, a thing that has happened in people. And so we have adapted it to dogs as well. So that's something that you can do also. How about geriatric onset laryngeal paralysis polyneuropathy? You remember that it is uh, large breed dogs, usually eight to 13, can have a couple of forms, your laryngeal paralysis form, and then going on to a polyneuropathy, so other nervous issues. Um, esophageal motility problems can cause things like regurgitation, weak muscles, unsteady gait. Uh, and, and so what do we do? Well. Conventional therapy is usually surgery, which may or may not be a good idea, um, and doxepin. So those are sort of the two things that are, that are looked at with this. But what do I look at with this? Well, weight management, I think that's something that anybody can do with these patients uh, because we want to make sure that they are uh, an ideal weight. If they're overweight, they have a lot more difficulty breathing. We don't want them to be doing a lot of activity. And then acupuncture. I do a lot of acupuncture on these dogs and I've had some very good success with them. And that's the herb that I will use. But physiotherapy, you get these dogs and have them do exercises like Cavaletti. Now we're not doing forcing them to run or anything like that, but we do want to have them move their muscles. These are the sorts of exercises we do. Hill walking maybe. Cookie stretches are really good. Cookies to the hips, cookies to the toes, because we're keeping them as limber as we can do sit to stands, teach them some backwards walking. Just don't let them go swimming. They can go on the underwater treadmill, but no swimming with these guys. And I think this is my last case. It's a very interesting case. This is, um, this is a dog with radial nerve paralysis. And uh, Penny was hit by a car in her driveway, run over by one of her owners, and had to go to the local emergency hospital, uh, needed, had a collapsed lung, and anyway, ended up 
with um, brachial plexus issues. And they said, well, once she recovers from her uh, lung problem, I will amputate the leg. And that wasn't what the client wanted. So they came to see me. So here she is, obviously, left front leg. Doesn't have a lot going on with that leg. So what did we do with her? Well, you know, we did, uh, we did acupuncture. That's one of the things that we did. We did some ACC loop with her. We did underwater treadmill. Uh, we did some exercises at home, but this is just her having her acupuncture. So we, we give them these peanut butter bowls, these frozen peanut butter bowls to keep them in place. And uh, it works really well. People ask me all the time, how do you get the dogs to sit still for acupuncture? This is how you do it. So here she was in, in the underwater treadmill and you'll see the therapist is having to pattern her foot. So she's picking it up. She's doing the neurological patterning for her. And this was a little bit later and she's recovered quite a bit. So she's really not having to do a lot of patterning for her. She's picking that foot up. She's just kind of tapping that muscle, stimulating things a little bit for her uh, while she's while she's in the treadmill and she's obviously not super normal there but look at this this is this is great isn't that amazing <laughs> Amazing. One of my one of my favorite videos. So I think at this point, um, we can take uh, some questions.